Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, most of you won't recognise me at all. I've just joined the Soil Association in the last couple of months um, and taken over from Colleen in facilitating this project from our point of view. Um, we're joined on the call today with um, by Tara and Ian from Environment Systems that you might have kind of seen before if you've already been involved with the project. Um, Vasilis from Edinburgh University, who's kind of Edinburgh's the other um, prong to running the project. And then we've also got our farmer speaker here tonight, which is Nick. So I think we'll kick off with Nick. I have got a couple of slides just to go through. Um, one of the things I wanted to do to start with and just to check to see if you can find those raised raising your hand button. Um, for those of you that this is the first kind of experience you've got with the project, can you just pop your hand up if you haven't heard anything about it before until you join tonight? We've got a couple. Fab. So we'll go into, we'll kind of cover it off a little bit, but we're not going to go into a huge amount of detail because it does look like everybody's kind of already been involved with the project. But if you do have any questions, either drop them in the chat or pop to our an email afterwards or myself and we'll can get those answered for you. So I'll just share the slides to start with. Um, so this is obviously the meeting we're doing today. We're just going to, Nick's going to give us a bit of an introduction to and kind of tell us a bit of a story about his farm and what it's been like this summer. Um, then Ian's going to cover off a little bit of kind of big picture stuff around, um, around the platform, but mostly around the weather and kind of what we're looking at going forward. Um, Vasilis is going to have a little talk about um, the grassland carbon cycle and then we'll go out into the breakout rooms. Oh, sorry, somebody being let in. Um, and then we'll come back together as one big group um, and just feedback and round off and hopefully we should be finished about half eight. So first slide, just or last slide for me really, um, for those couple that are brand new to pastoral, where it's a platform and it's looking at using satellite data and advanced algorithms to deliver intelligence on grass biomass and carbon. So this is a co-design project, so that's why all of you are involved, hopefully, and it gives you an opportunity to kind of give your opinion on how this is going to look, how it will work, what parts are going to be useful. Um, and that's kind of the process all the way through is to keep developing a little bit and coming back to you guys to seeing if it's working or not. So over to Nick to give us a bit of a story about his farm. Um, Nick, I'll take these slides back down for now so we can see you and then um, I'll pop them back up again for you to go through the pictures. That's fine. I might uh, need a couple of the pictures as we go, but I'll, I'll okay, keep, I'll just keep you right. Sure. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Nick Broad with a, a small uh, mixed farm from Low Wensidale. Um, not that I'm sort of particularly small, but uh, I don't really have much land. Um, but no, Tara came a couple of weeks ago and she um, persuaded me to have a discussion about diverse layers on our farm. Um, this isn't really a formal presentation, but um, I want to cover, if you like, how diverse layers came about on the farm and how they've evolved and how we've adapted the rotations uh, to incorporate and establish those layers. So the first half, I'm going to give you a little bit of um, background to that. And then as uh, as been alluded to, we'll, we'll look at some photographs um, and they obviously tell in a lot more ways than words can um, what we're trying to demonstrate. The photos um, do come with a bit of a health warning, as I'm I'm not very good at getting out and taking photos of disasters. So they're all uh, a lot of successes, but I don't want you to go away thinking that everything's hunky dory, because uh, as you know, behind every uh, photograph of a success, there's probably a hundred of failures that we've had. Um, but anyway, we'll end up with touching on how how it's gone this year and the challenges uh, that we've had in our system and how it's responded, and particularly the uh, the silage and the grazing. 
It is a very quick whistle stop tour, as, as you're aware. It's a massive subject here, but the idea is hopefully it'll kickstart that discussion that we're going to have in these uh, breakaway groups. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk more in depth either at an, another farm visit or, or uh, other workshops. So we're a small farm, as I've said, 150 acres at home, um, but we've now uh, an additional 50 acres that we rent in for summer grazing. Uh, we were in dairy till 15 years ago, uh, and since then we've developed a multi-suckling beef enterprise, and we take in uh, beef cross calves from one farm up the road and take them right through to finished. Um, we've sort of grown to around 250 head, ranging across all ages. Um, and we rear around 130 calves a year on six retired dairy cows. Um, 25 years ago, um, milk price crashed and I came across a guy called Alan Savory uh, and the concept of holistic land management. And I realised that we were doing quite a lot of that, um, but it sort of galvanised our understanding of how all these systems and every single thing that we do on the farm is totally independent, inter dependent. Tonight we're going to mainly look at crops and soils but obviously the animals are a, a vital part to that uh, part of the cycle and we deepened our understanding of this when we started an organic journey at the same time uh, and I became very interested in what I term as source and sink relations uh, through the cycle of rotations that we have but also the potential synergy that exists within each stage of that rotation. And I'll explain what I mean by this as we go on. The journey began, I guess, with a, an early appreciation of the power of clover and particularly red clover. It had a massive potential to fix nitrogen, a high protein feed and an amazing soil con conditioner. Now, I don't know if you can put photograph two up um, now, please, and just uh, have a look at that. So um, what I've put this up to illustrate is that we made many mistakes trying to harness this power of clover. And this is a crop of spring oats following a, a pretty much pure stand of red clover. Looks impressive. Ended up being totally flat when it came to harvest and growing through. Um, so the power of that clover to fix nitrogen is pretty immense. Um, we also learned the hard way about dealing with bloat and we lost a few animals along the way. And also that its soil conditioning properties uh, are a double-edged sword. In other words, its deep roots and rhizomes work very well, but they totally dominate and nothing else will grow with it if you're not careful. But it was this huge potential to fix nitrogen that started me experimenting with different forages that would act as a big sink to be able to utilise this nitrogen um, and stimulate it to keep producing more nitrogen. So I got interested in uh, coxfoot to start with, which is sounds a bit odd, quite old grass, uh, fairly unpalatable. But we found that our cows were seeking it out in the hedgebacks when we had these clover layers. And it turns out they were obviously looking for that structural fibre, uh, which coxfoot has in spades and also uh, could potentially help us with this issue of bloat. Um, and because it was deep rooted, it could compete with the, those uh, rhizomes of the red clover. We also looked at uh, Italians and hybrids, which were very aggressive too, uh, as well as providing that fiber again and competing with the clover. Uh, they also had higher levels of sugar, which I'll come on to in a bit. We also looked at other grasses too, and legumes and herbs as part of this mixture. And how, if you like that fusion, of those enabled a totally different response to that that you see in the NIAB list when you're looking at varieties of grass when they're grown in isolation. Now we're on what you call boys land, uh, sandy loam, sandy clay loam land, which is fantastic grade two and grade three soil, but it's very hungry. And we found that because clover had this vast potential to scavenge P and K in its need to fix N, over time, we didn't really have enough uh, manure on the farm to replenish this. 
And so we found that the nitrogen became a bit limited in our system. Um, we'd created these big sinks, but they were no longer able to be filled. But we found that uh, also that we were starving the soil's ability to deal with organic mat matter and its uh, breakdown. Uh, and it would always prioritize this breakdown rather than supply the subsequent crops with, with nitrogen. We decided to move away from organic uh, officially 10 years ago for, for quite a few reasons, um, mainly down to uh, the supply of animals, uh, organic animals locally. But um, when we went conventional, if you like, we didn't start chucking loads of fertilizer at the, the grassland, but it enabled us to grow the numbers of animals by renting in extra gra grazing locally. And by doing that, we had more uh, FYM available to us and uh, we found that we had enough uh, to apply in spring and also on the silage land, uh, a small dose after second cut. And uh, we realised then that not only were we adding to the chemistry, we were fueling the, the soil biology, but you dramatically increase then the soil's ability to reinvest the addition you've added to grow a leguminous layer that has the ability to capture even more carbon and more nitrogen from the atmosphere. And this not only returns that investment, but returns it with interest if you include a complex mixture. The complex architecture of its canopy allows it to capture a much wider spectrum of photosynthetically active radiation. But more than this, as the season progresses, if you like, you get this perpetual relay race effect so that the baton is always held by a team of plants that will maximize resource capture on every day. And that's just above ground. The other thing, taking this a step further, is that as well as variations through the year, the complex mix will adapt to variations within a given field. And I find that this turns precision agriculture on its head. So rather than trying to vary and target nutrient inputs to a crop, if you provide a vast range of crops that can harness the spectrum of nutrients that are available in that field, and it's far more precise and reliable because uh, biology operates in real time. And increasingly, that's obviously important as the climate dictates these extremes and it becomes harder to predict nutrient availability. The overall result, of course, is a net gain in carbon and nitrogen into the system. If you then use this carbon and nitrogen as part of a rotation to grow an energy crop, such as a cereal, you can start to unlock the potential of the legumes. And what I mean by this is that I believe you need an adequate energy source to unlock the availability of the rumen degradable protein part of that clover. It's well known that the polyphenyl oxidase in clover protects the protein in the silage clamp, but it also protects it in the rumen. So you also need the highest sugar grasses possible in the sword because there won't be very many of them. And you need to provide that energy for when you're grazing and also to provide adequate fermentation when you're making silage. So as I said, you need that additional energy in the form of either starch or sugar to unlock the potential of the forage. Or as the phrase I've coined, is you end up being like a man pushing a bike down the road that hasn't time to get on it. Anyway, I've talked enough at length about that story. Let's have a look at the rotations then. So if we can have the next photo, please, uh, in the system. So having had a, we'll start uh, with bringing the herbal lay out of, out of the rotation. We've had it in for four years there. We're now in the fifth year of direct drilling uh, into the uh, desiccated sward with a Claydon drill. Uh, we've had mixed results with this. This is uh, one of the early years that, that we did that. Um, we'll have a look later on of how we've refined this to give a better establishment, but we've had very good yields uh, and so we've persevered with that. 
if you move on to the next photo, um, I've extended this diver diverse crop theory into the cereals too and uh, developed a mixture uh, of winter oats and winter barley with uh, two varieties of each. And again, um, I find it is more adaptive to the variations uh, in the field and in the year and with the climate. Uh, it's less prone to disease. It's perhaps less demanding than a pure stand of winter barley, but it is probably more energy dense than pure winter oats on their own. Um, and also I find that it's a fantastic feed for the animals with that a bit of extra oil and soil, soluble fibre uh, in the oat husk. So if you move on to the next slide, the, so following the winter cereal, we would go in with a cover crop uh, direct into the stubble. And this has potential to produce massive amounts of biomass after the main crop without any input. And as discussed before, as well as the biomass itself coming from the invested carbon and nitrogen from before, you create this massive resource capture machine to reinvest that back into the soil with interest for the next crop. And all of this at a time of year when many of the fields around us are bare and nothing in them. So if we look at the next photo, that talks about how we destroy that or return that biomass, we bring in sheep. The, I find that the ruminant will take all that biomass, including the structural cellulose and hemicellulose and lignin, and turn it into an oven-ready food that the soil can utilise with a minimal expenditure of energy and thus make it very available for the next crop. So if you put the next photo up, uh, also, we, if you can see just in the distance, we've uh, got the sheep on that winter cereal crop, uh, which we graze them off completely to. Um, do this, it removes any disease. It encourages tillering. But more crucially, I find that it delays that cereal's development by around two weeks in the spring. And by doing that, I find that that allows the soil temperature to rise just enough so that you get an adequate nitrogen mineralization to be able to support all the extra tillers that will appear. So if we put the next slide up, once we've eaten that cover crop off, um, controversially, we're going with a plough, uh, but very shallow, five to six inches only. And we have tried direct drilling, but we found that we needed to delay drilling uh, for this to be effective and get a good establishment. And I just think we're missing that opportunity for the next crop, which is going to be spring barley. We're missing that opportunity for it to tiller. The other thing is, I don't really want to start and use a lot of expensive chemistry for grass weed control. Uh, and also I find that this gives us a clean entry uh, for the layer that we're going to establish after the spring barley. So hopefully if we go on to the next photo, we're going to get a good seed bed um, to get that barley off to a, a good start. Uh, that was drilled on the 10th of, May, 10th of March this year. Um, and note the ridicule that I get from our neighbours using a small two-wheel drive tractor to, uh, to, to drill it, um, but I'm, I'm massively into uh, having a minimal compaction. So hopefully you get that barley away, and if we move on to the next photo, we'll end up with a thick crop uh, that's going to tiller well and smother everything else and reduce the need for a lot of other inputs. If you go on to the next photo, uh, we did use to under sow to establish the, the grass lay. Uh, we would combine the, the crop and then wrap the straw, as you can see there. Uh, it did work very well. The only thing is to get an effective take of grass, you need to really reduce that uh, cereal seed rate back. Um, and, you know, obviously you're compromising the, the yield of that. The other thing is, as we've moved more on to the herb rich lays, um, you're struggling a little bit with weed control in the spring um, and virtually, it's virtually impossible to uh, do anything to control a lot of the weeds and not, uh, if you like, if you're using sprays to, to spray out the herbs. 
So if we go on to the next slide then, and uh, after that uh, spring barley, we establish our um, the, 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 the legume and herb rich lay. Um, again, one benefit of getting that spring barley in early is that the opportunity to get the lay in is also earlier. Um, normally you would expect around a week to 10 days after the, uh, after the winter to cereals are ready, but this year it all came at the same time, which was uh, quite bizarre. Um, but anyway, you'll see there, um, we also include uh, forage rape and Westerwald ryegrass and crimson clover in there. Um, and I put that in to protect that herbal lay as it's establishing. Um, this year, I think it was pretty crucial. You can see there, some of that rape is, is quite drought stressed. Um, but that rape creates a bit of a microclimate and its big leaves uh, act as a little bit of a trap for, for moisture when we get those heavy dews. And the Westerwall ryegrass, uh, I find, draws the moisture up from, from low down as well as nutrients. And that crimson clover being quick to establish will provide a bit of early end. Uh, so that was struggling, um, but then we got a bit of rain. If you put the next slide on, three weeks later, it was looking an awful lot better. And then this one taken on Monday, uh, it's the next photo, uh, please. You'll see that uh, it's absolutely romping away. Um, if, you, if you then shows the next photo, you can see the cattle have just grazed that margin. If you look very carefully, um, it looks like a big dense canopy of rape, but there beneath it, you can see that diverse lay is hiding away in the bottom. Um, and again, we will graze that with sheep over the winter and uh, that, that herbal lay will, will lay there and, and uh, kickstart itself in the following spring. So um, one thing this year, uh, when we were putting the layers in, in August, uh, it was a bit like drilling into a desert. Um, and I was very worried that we were going to get anything at all, but uh, with a bit of faith, uh, they did come eventually. So we'll take a quick look at the, the silage layers then um, and how they performed. Um, so first cut, the, again, uh, this looks pretty impressive, but this was uh, the first year of the last year's sown lay uh, and, uh, and it was a, a tremendous crop. Uh, this was taken on the 25th of May um and quite unbelievable given that the sheep left that field on the 28th of march so um quite an impressive catch up there if you put the next slide on i just have used this to uh illustrate the uh that source sink uh relation that i talked about and again that huge canopy that we've just seen with that first cut as well as it being a sink it's returning that source that it was with the carbon and nitrogen into the system. And if you just look at the colour of that, you would think that I'd been on with 300 weight of nitrogen. It just was absolutely blue. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and then if you move on to the next slide. So second cut, we took that on the 13th of July. Um, again, a good crop, but now it was starting to get very dry. Um, and the aftermaths of that, if you put the next photo on, uh, we then saw this absolute proliferation of lucerne, uh, which was amazing. There was hardly any lucerne in the mix. Um, it was there. Um, and uh, and then here we are, it, uh, it suddenly appeared. So um, cometh the drought, cometh the plant, as I say, um, and suddenly, it is better at carrying that baton that we talked about than anything else. So if we move on to the, the third cut, the next slide on the 27th of August, impressive again um, and uh, um, fantastic yield. The issue we had was that we didn't have much land left because we'd actually had to sacrifice a lot of the silage land to, to graze the cattle. If you go on to the next two photographs, a little bit of an aside, uh, if both those two there, um, we're in the uh, coming to the end of our five year mid tier stewardship of which the herbal layers are in it. But we have two or three people in the area that also have uh, species rich grassland. Um, and as they don't have many animals, uh, we 
made hay from that last year and I fed it to uh, my weaned calves and I found that they did so well um, that we've repeated that this year and luckily we had the weather um, and uh, again it's it's worked very well so again it's it's uh, working with other people as well in the area so if you put onto the next slide one of the biggest challenges I think we've had on our farm has been the lack of water for the animals to drink um, we rely heavily on spring water and becks that run through the farm uh, becks that have never historically dried up uh, this year they have and so we've had a big problem with uh, infrastructure of water and during that extreme heat uh, the Tuesday when it uh, was over nearly over 40 degrees uh, we actually decided to bring everything in or most things in so that not only could they get shade but actually uh, find water because we, we really struggled. So if we move on to the next photo um, we were very lucky and uh, I think that it might not play, but that is a video. Um, and we had one or two of these downpours. That was 20 mils of rain in around four minutes. Um, and yeah, it didn't last long, but it saved us. Uh, I think our silage land in particular and the cereals got just enough rain to keep it going through. Um, and, you know, we, we know that other parts of the country weren't lucky enough to get that um, but if you go on to the next photograph as I've mentioned before uh, oh that's that's plain yeah it was basically just a white out um, I know quite a few other people have had this in the country but uh, two days later you wouldn't think we'd had anything um, which was quite a bit uh, amazing so yeah as I said um, one of the downsides of probably being in the scheme is that uh, we have to rest the lay for five weeks uh, after that uh, first cut. And as we were running out of grass on the some of the permanent pasture, we had to graze uh, and let cattle into 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 uh, you know bigger covers than you would normally. Um, but uh, if you put the next slide on. It was amazing how they utilised that down very quickly and we were able to set up a pretty uh, regular rotational grazing paddock system um, and that kept us going. I mean, that land there is very light indeed, um, but it kept going right through. It was quite impressive, really. Um, so if you put the next slide on. Uh, that's just showing the aftermath grazing after the third cut that we did um, and we've had bits of rain um, and that's kicked into life now and we've had sort of four rounds if you like of rotational grazing following the uh, following that third cut uh, and again that was a beauty of getting that off in good time um, and it's allowed us to to really uh, to, to put put back as well um, a bit of what we've taken out so so yeah, put, if you put the next slide on, just a quick resume of the cereals. The, the, the mixed cereal that I've described did wonderfully well. Um, again, a bit of luck involved. The two fields that it was in uh, was probably the wettest fields on the farm. This is sort of drained, reclaimed land, black mar land. Um, normally it would be sort of underwater over winter, um, but this year we got away with it and we were able to get a good crop from it. Um, and if you put the next one on, um, this is just going back to, as I said, a bit about refining the uh, establishment of the cereals, uh, the winter cereals. And so this year we reduced the rate of glyphosate down to about half. And uh, then we used a Simber Express to break up uh, the, so the surface, but also uh, it had subsoiling legs on. So I felt that having had a four year lay with a lot of silage activity, there was a bit of compaction. And so that dealt with that at the same time. And then we uh, went through and further cultivated it to uh, shake, basically shake the soil off the sod. Uh, and that worked really well. The, the, the sods have all died off and um, it gave us a little bit more loose soil to get a better contact with the uh, with the seed. And we've ended up with, I would say, pretty much. 90 to 95 percent establishment um, 
And then the, the next slide, the penultimate one, uh, by reducing that glyphosate down, if you look carefully, um, the clover is beginning to come back there. Uh, and uh, we did this uh, a couple of times before with, uh, with, with the, the uh, looking at the application rate. And we can, if we can get that clover to go, we're hopefully we're going to get that uh, living mulch and that will linger in the bottom of the of the cereal crop and, and do a number of jobs as well next year. So that's that's about all I wanted to say, really. As I say, it's been a rapid journey through. Um, if you put the last slide on, um, just really not to underestimate the potential of these uh, diverse layers for both silage and grazing. Um, and this year, we're a very dry farm generally. We have had some rainfall, but I've been absolutely blown away by what they can do. Um, and so hopefully that will stimulate quite a bit of discussion and, uh, and a little bit of um, thought as we go into these breakaway workshops. Brilliant. Thank you, Nick. That was really, really good um, and so much detail, which is just fantastic. Um, has anybody got any pressing or in questions for Nick before we go on to chat a bit about more of the kind of the climate stuff with Ian? Either want to shout out or pop your hand up. I think everybody's just absorbing Nick. <laughs> I think there's, there was a lot there. Um, we can, we'll come back to some questions at the end anyway. So if you think of them or um, if you want to pop them in the chat or anything, we can do it that way as well. So we're going to go on to Ian now from Environment Systems. Who I am, I'll double check that I've given him permission to present. Um, and he's going to talk a little bit about, here we go, you should be able to present now, Ian. There we go. Perfect. Great. Oh, we can't hear. Are you, are you talking? That's my problem. There so we I go. <laughs> mute buttons here. I've also got a bit of a cough, so I'll be muting and unmuting as we go along, probably. Um, I was just going to talk. Uh, quite quickly um, about some of the some of the observations we've been making this summer uh, for the pastoral project um, particularly during the time of the drought what uh, what we've been seeing going on and um, yeah hopefully food for thought really so the the starting um, place is this is what we would expect an image captured in July to look like. So this is July 2021. Uh, it's a composite of, of exactly the imagery that we're using in the in the project. But you can see that there's um, west of the country, nice and green, Ireland very green. Uh, most of England is different degrees of brown, different cereal crops are, are coming towards the, the harvest periods as they're maturing, etc. Maybe there's some, some ploughing, etc. But for the most part, green productive vegetation across the country. When we look at July 2022, I think it speaks for itself when you compare the greenness that's dominating that image to the brown that we can see everywhere here. The, <clears throat> the drought had a massive effect across the country. We see it um, in all the different types of data that we've been been working with in environment systems and in the pastoral project. Um, see that as the uh, crops that are maturing much faster, they're desiccating much earlier, or pa pastures that are basically um, burnt off or, or dried up, etc. But there are some interesting details you can still see in terms of where the ground is maintain maintaining moisture, where the soil is, is holding moisture, and, and you you're getting more productive vegetation. So we see the 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 dales, the the Pennines, the they're staying much more productive during this period. 
whales again, you know, as, as you might expect, but also some of the deeper soils around about the Wash, East Anglia, and along the South, Do South Downs. It, it really does show that difference that the soil is having in terms of increasing the amount of water availability, increasing the productivity you know, of, of the crops. So it's really interesting to see that kind of really stark difference between 2021 2022 but also how in 2022 it's bringing out the difference that's the effects that soil is having here and um, on <clears throat> increasing the, the productivity of vegetation if we look at what that means for an individual farm so this is um the leaf area index product or the, or the green area product that we're primarily using in pastoral it's it's an observation of the the crop and it is estimating how much vertical structure of the leaf canopy there is. Now these happen to be some fields that are that have kept a, a really dense um, cover over winter. Um, so here, seeing in January here, these fields have got a very dense, productive crop. We go through January, February, March. We're seeing some fluctuations at the start of the year as there's maybe some management activities going on. April. Now, when you're seeing these great big white blocks, these are fields that have probably been um, plowed or harvested in some way. Now we're coming into June, we can see that um, there's some harvesting going on here, but crops come through on these fields here. And then you get to July. Uh, ignore these white patches where my cursor currently is, that's cloud. But the rest of it, all these white fields, these are these yellow outlines here are fields that are in the project. You can see how much crop has just, how much the, the grass in these fields has just dried away. Then into August, that's very much in line with that picture we were seeing of the whole country there. The, the sward has just been baked off, dried up. Um, it's really quite a, a substantial reduction ahead against what we would expect. Good news, rain comes, grass grows, it has come back and recovered. Um, so we are seeing that you know that, that drought has recovered as, as the, the rain has come. But when you compare the the data that we've gathered in the project for this year versus last year. So let me explain this slide. This is every field we've, we're looking at in the project. So this is 500 fields. And we've taken the average um, leaf area index per field per month and compared for all those fields 2021 against 2022. So we can really see that effect in July and August where the, the biomass has just reduced significantly substantially as a result of the drought. Um, much lower than we would expect, but that recovery into September and we're getting much closer to where the where the grass levels or the, the biomass levels should be. Um, so, so the recovery is there. Starting to think though, well, what if we start separating out these different um, swords, the, the different fields by their sword type, the, the community? So I think this is actually quite interesting. We've categorized the, the fields loosely by their dominant vegetation type. So we're now tracking month by month, all the fields that are in grass, what's the average green cover versus grass, grass clover, herbal diverse lays and naturalized as permanent pastures. You can see that the key thing that's quite interesting to my eye here in May is we're reaching much higher total um, leaf area indexes, or green area indexes in the grass clover and herbal slash diverse lay mixes. Much more so than you're seeing in the grass. It's possibly a function just of leaf structure with grass being grass dominated swords being much more vertical the grass clover and diverse leaves having much more flat leaves to a satellite that's going to look like a much denser um, sward if all your leaves are facing that way rather than that way so there's something to, to bear in mind there but the thing I found really really interesting is when you look into July so June July August into that um, into the drought <coughs> 
the natural swords are keeping higher biomass than the other swords. So we've seen that that um, possibly has better soil structure. I'm sure it's open to questions from, from, from you guys what that might mean, but we're seeing those naturalized swords that there's a, they're holding the biomass better, holding the green leaf longer, and also the grass and clover is performing really well. Um, and the worst of all of them in July was, was just the grass on its own. The, the fields are most dominated by grass on their own. And then we've got a recovery happening again. So some loose observations just about what we were seeing. I hope that's interesting. We can come back to that if there's any questions about what's in there. And this is just looking at the 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 quality of the sward um, over the over the the drought period. <clears throat> Thinking forwards now, how likely is a is an event like that? To be in the future well we know with climate change um, it's projected that we're going to be getting drier summers we're going to be getting increased precipitation at certain periods um, with an overall period overall reduction in total precipitation so increased um, fluctuation in um, rainfall if you compare this is a, a map from, from this year where they were looking at the temperature anomaly. So that was a, a two degree temperature anomaly. So the temperatures were on average two degrees higher in the, in the dark red, one and a half degrees, one, et cetera, versus 1991 to 2020. So it's quite sobering when you think that was 2%, two degrees above um, the a two degree anomaly caused the effects we're seeing there. By 2060 to 2080, the projections are suggesting that we're going to be getting anomalies of four, five degrees, even six or seven degrees. I find that really sobering. You know, we're having severe impacts upon biomass. Perhaps there's some ability to change what you're doing by, by selecting your your seed mixes, your sword types, etc. But that's only a two degree change. If you're getting into a double that and temperature anomaly, combined with obviously much lower general precipitation, again, this is uh, projections for 2060 to 2080, talking about, you know, minus 20, minus 30% um, precipitation. That's really quite worrying stuff. I've got no answers here, <laughs> but it's it's really it's. I found that quite sobering. I was also having a look at the the most recent August twenty twenty two climate um, projections, and the the most recent update in there, making some statements like among all the top ten warmest years have occurred since two thousand and two, and the UK temperatures in line with a one degree centigrade increase globally since the Industrial Revolution. Then when we're thinking about the commitment to trying to keep climate change to a 1.5 degree increase, we can see that we're already quite far towards that target. We're seeing that it's projected that hot summers are expected to become more common. So this summer was as hot as 2018, there or thereabouts, with higher peak temperatures. Um, the chances of seeing a summer as hot as 2018 is between 12 and 25 percent. So one in eight to one in four summers like this summer. By mid-century, that could be like 50 to 60 percent. Yeah, it's really quite worrying, I suppose. Um, and again, really in line with what Nick was talking about, it's not just that we've got this drying trend, we've also got increased intensity of heavy summer rainfall. So when you're getting all of that rainfall happening over a day, that's gonna become increasingly the pattern that appears. The challenge with intense rainfall like that is it becomes much more localized. So you're gonna have some farms, some areas getting enough rainfall and maybe the valley next door, not. That increases the, the risk, it just increases the, the variability of what we're talking about. The other thing I thought was really quite interesting here as well was this a change to the seasonality of extremes. At the moment, a lot of those extremes are in the summer. 
looking forwards, we're talking about increased seasonality even into the autumn. So increased intensity of rainfall out into the autumn as well. What effects that might have is, um, yeah, something to think about. So I don't want to be too gloom and doom here, but I just thought that was quite interesting. Just thinking about what we've seen, some pictures of what we're seeing in terms of the the, the sward types and perhaps some indications that there might be some better responses from some of the long term rotations and from the, the grass clover. Um, and just a final little bit just about what we've been doing in the project this summer. We've been spending a lot of time, I say we, Tara has been spending a lot of time out gathering a lot of calibration data to help us take the satellite imagery and the model data and turn it into useful measurements that are that are monitoring the grassland. Um, and uh, we'll be talking more about that in, in due course as the project goes along. The final thing though, on the reason I'm talking about this though, is this has also caused us a headache this summer because it was so dry, there wasn't much grass. So a lot of our data has been collected at very, very low biomass levels, very low kilograms dry matter a hectare, which means we've got good data at the low end of the curve, but we're needing more data moving up into the higher grass levels. So that's also been the challenge just in terms of the project itself. Um, that's it. I hope you found that interesting and not too depressing. Um, and I'll open it to any questions or we can, we can chat as we go along or whatever. That's brilliant. Thanks, Neil. I think it's Neil, Ian. Sorry, where my brain's gone, I have no idea. Um, yeah, and I think there is some positives to be pulled out of that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely food for thought with what, what people are putting in for days and stuff. Does anybody have any questions for Ian about what he's just talked about? Yeah, Christine, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, on that graph, there was um, neutralisation or something. What's that all about? Naturalised grasslands. It yeah, was, that's... Uh, Tara, do you want to explain what we meant by that? Yeah, so in our, it's a very rough categorization. So the naturalized is what is a word we've been using to term permanent pastures that haven't been reseeded. So they're kind of a mixture of different grasses, just depending on the location where they are. Um, but they're more permanent pastures where it's kind of less obvious what the dominant species are. Uh, thanks very much. Can I ask also, how did you measure the different, um, different sward, different types of um you know grasslands that the words clovers the mixes in the grass when you came out because i went there when you came out yeah um so we kind of um measure the whole sward as it is um so when i go out into the field i mark an area that's about 20 by 20 meters um and that's we we know where that is because we record it on a gps so we can kind of match that back to the exact um, pixels of the satellite imagery we're using um, and then we take a range of measures um, across that area. Um, so some of the equipment that was on one of those final pictures Ian showed, so we've got a plate meter. Um, I think you were one of the first farms I visited, so I didn't have the um, one of the devices we use that measures the amount of light that goes through the canopy. Um, and that's used to kind of indicate the amount of leaf material. Um, and we can also do it by cutting a, a, all the leaf from a, a known area of ground. Um, and calculating the area of the leaves that way um, and then essentially measuring measuring how much leaf material you've got on the ground and comparing that back to the satellite. Yeah, yeah that, that would have been really useful to have seen as well really because I was struggling for, for the SFI pilot to work out how much percentage was you know more accurately than when just like well it looks about 50 percent so it would have been useful to have actually seen that data. I think we could probably share that if you're interested yeah i can probably um, drop me an email afterwards i can probably share some with you yeah thank you right, thank you christine and um, peter do you have a question as well yeah i was just finding it really interesting around the sort of nix system which is very high intensity high output um and also the system that we run on our farm down in the southwest here where we have mainly permanent pastures but we have a very high organic matter in the soil and the, the sort of I'm having to grapple at the moment between which sort of business model do you go down? Do you go down to the high performance, high 
you know, high turnover of um, grass lay, or do you stick with the more what they call naturalized, but just accept that you have a lower inputs and lower output? So it's it's actually quite interesting to see how each different business deals with that. Yeah, very interesting. And I think one of the things there, like obviously the graphs showed that that naturalized actually was quite resilient to the weather, um, which is going to become a increasingly important factor. But then equally on Nick's farm, it's he's got away with it and it actually some of the those new lays have done incredibly well. Um, I don't think there's going to be a magic answer to that, though, I'm afraid, Peter, it's quite a it's going to be very, very specific to the farm and stuff. But um, hopefully as we get more data, it should kind of help you make a decision one way or the other. I think I think one one uh, comment I would have there. I mean, we have permanent pasture on our land. Uh, I mean, the organic matter levels in those. I mean, on our arable land, you know, we're on light land. Uh, sort of four to eight percent is 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 good, and you know, but on some of our permanent pastures, uh, we've got into the twenties of organic matter, but they're burnt off. You know, they're droughted off, and we ended up having to use the herbal layers. Uh, to feed the cattle in the summer um, so you know just on our farm I would say that you know there is you know you have to think of that I think the other thing is in your naturalized you showed it as having a higher biomass um, but presumably they would be mainly grazed whereas a lot of the other mixes were probably silage layers as well like mine and so you know the at times your recordings for biomass were probably lower at, at certain times during the summer, yeah. if that makes sense, than yeah. the naturalised where they would just be grazed, yeah. um, you know. And again, it depends on the type of grazing. If yeah. you've got, you know, sort of a, a more of a ranch type system where you've got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of cover of sort of uh, everything, it would record that as biomass, and but a lot, a lot of it would be productive, you know, so... 100% agree and there's a whole load of other things that I haven't gone into that analysis like you know soil type that's that's yeah. a huge range of soil types in there um so totally not trying to say that that's any sort of answers but I, I just found it some interesting um interesting observations there but I think you're totally right as well about looking at the the reduction could just be people also taking it taking silage off getting that cut in before it then dries out too much where you've still got something productive in the field that you wanted to capture uh, ahead yeah. of the drought or as the droughts begin to come in so ha yeah. ha hands up here not saying there's there's any hard and fast there i mean the, the only thing i would say into your answer to the intensity i mean if i had more land now i'm finding with these herbal layers uh, like the ones that I destro destroyed this autumn to put into a cereal, it was sacrilege, really, because they were just in the prime. You know, I, I think they would they would have lasted uh, for many more years than four because of you know things have come on with red clovers and things. Um, so you know, um, it, it's that's the the other dilemma is like you say, do you go down that reseeding route every? sort of three or four years um or if you have the land as it were you can you can extend that and and make make more use of of those the length of the layers um which certainly would help with the economic side great thank you nick um yeah lots to think about and actually that the some of what you said there does lead into what we'll be talking about in the breakout rooms because from the project point of view actually being able to start breaking it down to the different um, management systems and stuff as well is going to play quite a big part in it. Um, so if that's all the questions for now, we're going to move on and Facilis is going to give us a short presentation. I think I've given you permission, Facilis, so you should be able to bash on straight away. It's working. Right. Is it working? Yes, yes, we can see it. That's fab. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, uh, yeah. Hopefully, my Mediterranean English accent won't be a problem. So and I'm I'm understood. So uh, I'll I'll quickly go through a bit of where that, that the model that we're using within pastoral came from because it's quite important to show that 
where we started. So that's almost five years of research in there. And the main reason is an interest at the, like a bigger level on, on the contribution of agriculture and climate to climate change. So about a fourth of greenhouse gas emissions on the global scale are related to food. And if we zoom into them, roughly 50% is somehow directly or indirectly related to uh, uh, livestock farming, either growing food for livestock or emissions due to livestock growing, so methane and, and, and so on. And if we look into what livestock is eating on a global scale, Roughly half percent of what they're eating is, is grasses and leaves, biomass that grows on grasslands. And in the UK, that percentage is even bigger. So uh, we realized that there is this area was understudied, and we started developing uh, a, a model that can uh, give us a better picture of what's happening to carbon uh, in grassland ecosystems. And uh, there's a, there's a, the UK is in a good position because it's one of the very few countries that you have a lot of data about things and data has been collected over decades. And for example, there is one of the few countries that you can trust your soil carbon information. And we know uh, from the literature, from studies that have taken place over the past 50 years uh, and been compiled uh, that the most carbon dense grasslands are those that are managed with intermediate management intensity. So that's that's a graph showing the cumulative soil carbon at zero centimeter depth at grasslands classified according to their management, whether it's more from more intensively managed to the more extensively managed grasslands. We know the average removed biomass for these three rough large categories. And we also know the distribution across the country. But as we go from land use to yields to soil carbon, our uncertainty increases. Uh, and we know less about what's happening in the soil. We know something about what's happening above ground, and we know quite well where the different types of agroecosystems are and how large they are. So there was an opportunity to try and understand that part better uh, so that we eventually understand that part even more. And the reason is that. This information feeds upwards and affects decision makers use it to shape policies on a global scale, on a continental scale, on a national scale, and so on. Um, and basically, we developed a model which actually does what this schematic will show. There's CO2 in the atmosphere, there's, there's water in the atmosphere, there's sun, and there's temperature. They mainly affect photosynthesis, so plants growing. Photosynthesis is, is the mechanism that, that accumulates biomass, it's allocated above ground, below ground. There is a cost to that process, so that there's carbon lost as respiration. Above ground biomass dies, below ground biomass also dies, a part of it, a fraction of it. Uh, it enters the soil litter layer, slowly then moves further down into the soil matrix, into the more recalcitrant soil organic matter pool. But even that has a cost because there are organisms that take over this like carbon transformation process and there is again carbon lost by the soil respiration and if we look at everything on that scale that's the ecosystem scale so the net balance of the fluxes is the net ecosystem carbon exchange as it's typically called if we throw the animals in then we're looking at the biome so livestock will eat biomass and carbon convert that to methane and respiration some of it will become flesh or milk eventually we lost to the atmosphere further down the line some of it will return to the soil as manure, either directly or stored and returned later on that ecosystem or a neighboring one or an, or, or an ecosystem further away. It's much more complicated. That's the biome scale of things. And basically, when the green arrows are, there's more carbon in the green arrows than in the red arrows, your ecosystem or your biome acts as a carbon sink. And when the red arrows have more carbon, then it acts as a source on an annual or multi-annual, decadal, I don't know, depending on the time frame that you're looking at things. So what we did is we put numbers on that and we developed a model and we tested it ext extensively using ground measure data from experimental stations in the UK. And uh, around 2019, we were ready to run it on a very large scale. And 
we thought it would be useful to see what's happening under drought conditions. And we were well, lucky to have a, a, an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented hit and drought event in summer 2018, affecting the UK and generally Northwest Europe quite intensively. Uh, and we had, we were in the sat high resolution satellite information era, so we could use satellite data on how much green stuff, biomass, how much leaf, leaves are there in ecosystems. We had data on the location of each field across, across the UK, and we were able to run our model for approximately uh, 2,000 fields that we randomly sampled from across uh, Great Britain. And need to mention, so the model uses environmental data to describe how, how um, a model grass will grow. And one of these factors, one of these drivers is VPD, vapor pressure deficit, the difference between the amount of moisture that the air can hold and the, the one that it actually does at every on every single day. And that's a special information we can obtain for any location across the globe uh, and of course across the UK. So that's a model driver, VPD. LAI is something we can observe from space. So we fit the model with environmental drivers. We constrain it with satellite observations and it gives us predictions. And for summer 2018, if we compare it, so we run the model for 2017, 2018, and the comparison shows that over the summer, the net ecosystem exchange, so that's the net balance of carbon during the three months of the year during summer, turned from uh, the majority. So each pixel that you see here has at least 10 randomly selected sites and fields simulated. And um, there are about, about 2,000 fields across Great Britain that were simulated. Again, just to clarify, blue means it's a carbon sink. Uh, red means it's a carbon so source over that three month summer period. And there's been a huge shift from sinks to sources between summer 2017 and 2018. Uh, there's been a change across the whole country, across all the 2000 fields. So there's the, the, the change map is red. So all of them were losing carbon compared to 2017. Some of them were losing a lot of carbon compared to the previous year. That kind of overlaps with the area most affected by the by the uh, heat and drought, so the, the highest anomaly, or almost more than locations that have even more than two degrees difference from the from the long term average. And we wanted to see that's what our model predicted. How does that compare to data? This limited number of of ground measure data. So that's a graph. So that's again that's net ecosystem exchange of carbon. So the cumulative carbon flux across a whole year, that's uh, an organically managed grassland uh, at, at Berkshire, managed by the Center for Ecology and Hydrology on behalf of the Natural and Environment Research Council. So there are sophisticated equipment measuring the actual exchange, so the actual CO2 moving in and out of a grassland. The blue curve shows how that looked in 2017. The orange curve shows how that looked in 2018. It didn't cross, it didn't, during summer, it didn't move from negative to positive, so it didn't become a thing, but it actually got close to becoming a, a source. So there's been, there's been a massive reduction in the capacity of the grassland to absorb um, carbon. Not the capacity, the absorbance of carbon. So again, the further up, so positive means source, negative means source just to clarify that all the time because it might be a bit confusing. Uh, and then uh, with these 500 pastoral sites, we wanted to see what's, what the model is predicting for them. So again, these are a bar plots showing vapor pressure deficits, which is a proxy of drought, uh, monthly for 2021 in blue, 2020, 22 in orange, summer 2022. So there's a drought, it's visible, it's reflected in the vapor pressure deficit. That's a model driver. That's, the, that's what the model uses to uh, be informed on, 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 on drought conditions and the in intensity of drought. Uh, these are, these are uh, 
Uh, so the results are from the five, almost 500 fields, uh, pastoral sites. Uh, this graph is showing above ground biomass. So the monthly mean above ground biomass in tons of diameter per hectare. That's after any removals. Okay, so that's that's what's standing, which essentially at the end of the month. If we take the removals out for 2021 and 2022, and we can see the effect of drought in the reduction of above ground biomass in mainly in August and September. We have no data for October, and November, and so on. So that will come come on as as we run further down 2022, and. As expected, the net ecosystem exchange of carbon, so these are, these are values in car, grams of carbon per square meter per week, 2021 in blue, 2022 in uh, orange. Positive values mean there's carbon going from the ecosystem towards the atmosphere. Negative values, there's carbon absorbed from the atmosphere and synced into the ecosystem. Uh, you could expect the sinking activity to be stronger as as there's more biomass uh, growing, so there is more absorption uh, and more assimilation of atmospheric carbon into biomass in April, May, June. It expected to happen uh, in, in, in July, but that didn't happen. It turned into a, into a carbon sink. So on average, these 500 pastoral sites turned into sinks. And in August, you would expect based on 2021 to have a, a source and they're a really small source, but you have a source that's almost double, more than double uh, that of the previous year. So this actually is, is the same picture as in 2018, more or less, for for a for a similar yet smaller sample of, of grassland sites. So in 2018, it was a random number of sites. It was a random selection of a larger number of sites. Now we have a 500 sites, and we hopefully know more about these sites. It's always important to know that, that, and that's the next slide, that models simplify things. And essentially what our model does is it simulates a model, theoretical, perennial ryegrass dominated grassland, which is not exactly what your pastoral sites are. It's a diverse. And its soil properties, species composition, man management choices play a huge role. And of course, our 2018 study, which was a pure research-based study, isn't the same as the, the things that we can learn now through pastoral and the way we can improve the model with using using more ground information. The key thing is that the, the more we know, the more robust our estimates will be. Some of the things that matter and we don't know, and treating Treating a simulated grassland as a as a mainly perennial ryegrass dominated grassland isn't doing like just is isn't the fair treatment. Is that there 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 are things that we don't consider, so there, we don't consider different uh, species and their traits, their rooting system, uh, which means we cannot really uh, be extremely detailed on how they might respond to drought. Uh, for instance, that, that like we don't really describe how mixtures might affect rooting systems and rooting patterns, and how what feedback that could have to water retention and response to drought. Uh, and that's because up until now we couldn't have a sufficiently large number of sites where we can get that sort of information and then look on the satellite observations, run our models, and and learn more and probably understand more and be able to to um, suggest solutions uh, about the things that uh, seem like they're gonna come are already here. Um, so I mean, when we were running things in 2019 for 2018, we weren't expecting a drought to occur again so quickly, uh, but it did in 2022. So, um, yeah, that was me. That was that was everything. Great, thank you, for this. Um, has anybody got any questions on the carbon cycle or the data from the pastoral field so far? I 
again it's quite a lot to take in at times as well so I think what we'll do is we'll send an email round afterwards with um the presentations on I think if that's all right with um and then it just gives everybody a chance to kind of look it over again if they want to um as I said at the beginning we are also recording so people can look back at it and stuff and then we're always about to answer questions later on so um if we haven't got any questions right now Tara is going to introduce what we're going to do in the breakout rooms and then I will click the magic button and it will send us all across to and um, we've got three different rooms going on um to just have a bit of more of a discussion um around some of the topics and some of the things that would be helpful for the kind of team to know with when we continue with development so Tara I'll hand it over to you Yep, thanks Tabitha. Um, yeah, so Vasilis kind of nicely included this in his final slide that it's really important for us, um, kind of as the pastoral team developing this, that we can understand as much as possible about um, kind of the systems you're using um, and what we're seeing from the satellite to to help us kind of improve, improve the modelling and basically try and get um, the most accurate and reliable data back to you. Um, so we're going to split into three groups each kind of focused on a slightly different topic um, but it'd be really great to just get a bit of discussion hear your ideas and um, let us know what you're doing um, and how if you're part of the pastoral project how you're kind of hoping um, that um, pastoral will kind of help you in any decision makings around that topic um, so the group's going to be one will be talking mostly focused on different types of paddock system um, one thing we're really interested to know about is um, winter pasture management because we've been seeing some interesting things happening on the imagery and we'd really like your help in kind of understanding what those are um, and also a kind of session on um, evidencing effects of extreme events um, so for example um, we had someone get in touch um, that was trying to put in a derogation to get non-organic feed um, due to silage shortages um, due to the drought over the summer um, so if anyone's kind of got any comments or ideas on that um, and also some whether you'd be happy in sharing more regular management information and um, so I think if we go into groups we do a little bit of a roundup um Tara do you want kind of it's kind of the key messages from your winter Yeah, so we did go slightly off topic um, and we started on uh, oh, helping sorry. us understand a bit about um, winter management. Um, so the general conversation kind of went to um, cover crops being kept in over winter for stewardship schemes. Um, I think most people in our group were um, out wintering, so they had kind of rotational grazing going on all winter as well. Um, and then we ended up talking more about just kind of general resilience in the system and the diverse wards and um, kind of kind of the not having all your eggs in one basket, having enough species that something's going to like the weather conditions um, and do well and just kind of having faith that that will work out in the end. Great. Um, Ian, what about your group? I think the, the main thing we were talking about uh, picking up on some of the things that Tara said there about not having all your eggs in one basket as well um diversity being important but also a lot of our conversations um revolving around the the carbon cycling piece that uh, Vasilis was talking about and how that evidencing could be useful but the real question is what is the the landscape of using of the of farmers being rewarded for appropriate carbon management what does that look like and how in fact you've almost got a bit of a perverse incentive at the moment not to nail it down too much because um you will get potentially you might potentially get more reward for improving from a poor baseline and already being at an optimal baseline which is great and doing the job nicely but do you get rewarded for you know maintaining rather than improving so some questions there are much more about the political structures around that the governmental structures around the carbon piece and uh, yeah i totally agree with that as well it's it's a challenge 
Yeah, um, I will use that opportunity to plug that um, the Soil Association are one of the suppliers of the um, Future Farm Resilience Fund. And that is exactly what we'll be talking about in the meetings. So again, there's three booked in for November across the country um, and they'll just be the first ones. And then we'll do one to one stuff as well. Um, there is going to be a meeting in the East. It's not booked in yet, though. Um, I just saw that question popped up as I was saying it. Um, so, yeah, so it, again, keep an eye out for those. That's exactly the stuff that we're going to be discussing in those kind of how to make the most of it and to ensure that you're not done out of. I mean, it's one of the lobbying things that we're doing at the moment as well to make sure people aren't um, punished, basically, for doing a good job now when money comes available. Um, our group was just a bit about um, paddock systems and everybody that I had are all doing various different types of rotational grazing, as can be imagined, and taking measurements and stuff. So it's definitely there's um, lots more to delve into on that. And kind of because even just within the three of us, there were, everybody was rotating and measuring, but um, doing at different heights and in kind of slightly different methods with different pressures on that as well. So it does make a big difference. So we are two minutes over time currently. Um, I will. I do want to give everybody an opportunity if anybody's got any other pressing questions that they want to ask now um, before we go. But do remember, you can always email us, either Tara or myself, um, and we can um, share answers and stuff around the group as well. So any questions before we finish? No. Well, don't don't hesitate to ask us um, over email or any or give us a call. Um, and thank you all for giving a part of your evening to join us. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, it's quite nice to come out of a meeting with lots more to talk about um, rather than everybody having sat in silence. So that's brilliant. So enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you for joining. Thank you very much. Bye.